Right, we continue with our study of perturbation theory. Are there any questions to start with? Any questions on what we have done so far? And the question is does the zero point energy of all these oscillators contribute? Because each oscillator contributes an energy half h cross omega and you are now integrating over all possible omegas. So does this contribute? What is it if so? The answer is that formally it is infinite of course. If you count if you put all the oscillators in the ground state and you have an infinite number of oscillators you integrate over all omega the answer is infinite. This is called the energy of the vacuum and a proper treatment of this infinity is done only in quantum field theory when one knows how to take care of the zero of the energy. A crude answer would be to say this is a reference level of energy the fact that when you got nothing you can set the energy to be equal to zero in the vacuum even though formally this calculation would give an infinite contribution that is a rather facile argument it is not a very satisfactory one it is resolved appropriately only in quantum field theory which is outside the purview of this course. But this zero point energy's divergence is important it does play a role there are effects by the way which measure this zero point energy the fact is that this energy has a physical role to play. Let me give since this has been raised let me give two instances of where it is going to play a role and how it is taken care of. One of them has to do with the so called Casimir effect and it is the following very simple observation. Suppose you have two parallel plates metallic plates in a vacuum and you place them parallel to each other at a short distance from each other the distance is small this distance d is small compared to the linear dimension l of the plates. So these are huge square plates and you place them close to each other and have nothing inside just a vacuum then because of the zero point energy in the system there actually exists an attractive force between these two plates due to the fluctuations of the electromagnetic field. So although you do not have any actual applied field in this region it is a vacuum even then there are these fluctuations of the electric field in the ground state even in the ground state of the system no quanta present and due to that we saw what it was we saw in the very simple example of uh, electrodynamics we saw that uh, the electric field for instance if it vanished at the two end points or at the two plates in between it can still have a mean square value which is non-zero and this leads to because of this energy it is a potential energy you take minus its gradient you are going to get a force there exists a force between these two plates and there is an attractive force and it is called the Casimir effect it can be computed exactly and in the late 50s in the last century it was actually measured. Since then refined experiments have been done which corroborate the quantum electrodynamic calculation. So this effect comes directly from the zero point energy that is a physical effect. The other effect which is very well known in spectroscopy is that the energy levels of atoms are shifted slightly due to these quantum fluctuations and of course in the ground state you do not see this thing at all but it will appear in the excited states of the atom and it is called the lamp shift and this has again been measured it is very accurately measured it is known to a very large number of decimal places and has been corroborated and that is the other effect which uh, which has been theoretically calculated and experimentally measured and this once again 
is uh, a uh, manifestation of the zero point energy of the system. There are other problems in quantum field theory, other problems of divergences, formal divergences in quantum field theory, but the zero point energy is the first of these for these oscillators and yes it does play a role except in when we compute the energy in black body radiation you can see that the contribution from the denominator the partition function and the numerator of this half h cross omega got cancelled out. So when you are actually computing the average energy etc this contribution has got cancelled out and you talk only about what is left which is frequency dependent. So in that sense this has been hidden the zero point energy has been hidden in that calculation okay. So any other question? Okay. Now let me recall to you what we had gone to uh, got to in perturbation theory. So we had a non-degenerate set of energy levels for a Hamiltonian H naught and I added to this a perturbation lambda h prime that was my total Hamiltonian and the idea was in principle we assume that we know how to solve for the eigenvalues and eigenfunctions of h naught. They form a complete set and then the question is what is the exact energy eigenvalues and eigenfunctions and the answer in general is that if h prime does not commute with h naught there is no simple way of writing down an explicit general formula for what the exact values of the eigenfunctions and eigenvalues are. But you can do a perturbation expansion and if uh, phi n0 is the eigenstate corresponding to E n0 in the absence of the perturbation for H0 and this is assumed to be a complete set of states and these are uh, non-degenerate set of eigenvalues, discrete eigenvalues, then the exact energy, the nth energy level is given by a perturbation series of the form E n 1 plus lambda squared E n 2 plus etcetera and in exactly the same way phi n is given by this plus lambda times phi n 1 plus lambda square and the idea was that this infinite series for sufficiently small lambda would actually converge to finite answer and you can compute to any desired degree of accuracy what these numbers are and we had found formulas for these things we found that E n 1 was nothing but the matrix element in the unperturbed basis of the perturbation. This by definition is H prime N N. So that was the first order correction to the energy. The second order correction to the energy was a little more complicated. This was a sum over all intermediate states L not equal to N and the matrix element H prime L n squared divided by E n 0 minus E n 0. So you had an energy denominator the difference between unperturbed energy levels and on top the weight associated with this energy denominator was the square of the modul uh, square modulus of this off diagonal matrix element H prime. This wave function, the state vector for example, this was equal to a summation L not equal to N and then again H prime L N over uh, E N 0 minus E L 0 and this was uh, phi L. We did not write down the second order calculation for the wave function for the state vector but it will involve two of these intermediate states and so on. So there would be a second sum m not equal to n E m minus uh, E n 0 minus E m 0 in the denominator and so on. Okay. 
So the important thing to note is that the energy eigenvalues here they proceed in a very systematic way with uh, the first one is just the diagonal elements of the perturbation the second one involves the square of the matrix elements the off diagonal elements with a single energy denominator the next one will involve higher powers of such products of such matrix elements divided by two energy denominators and so on okay and this already in the first order has such a correction out there here. Now we found this result by imposing the, the requirement that just as this is normalized this too is normalized here and there is nothing arbitrary about it it is normalized at every order of perturbation theory so this is the exact answer this plus this is the first order answer lambda times this okay. Now of course there are situations where the first order correction may vanish identically for instance if this perturbation so if it does not have diagonal matrix elements at all this is gone and then you have you start with the second order correction etc. Now when does this whole thing converge it is clear that the convergence is going to depend on this quantity. So in general the, the assumption is that all the off diagonal matrix elements are sufficiently small compared to the differences in energy levels then this series has a hope for convergence this is not a rigorous proof because we do not know what these general coefficients are but on the face of it it seems looking at the structure of these terms that if this is sufficiently small you are going to be in good shape okay. So what you need is you are going to be in good shape for sufficiently small lambda so really you need a lambda times this, is this guy here since lambda appears always with it that quantity should be sufficiently small okay. The difficulty arises when this is 0 when you have a degenerate state then of course you do not know what to do because this is going to become infinite it is going to blow up here right? and then the question is what are you going to do in such a situation okay. Before I do that before we tackle that let me give some examples of perturbation theory let us take a couple of examples and you can see uh, how these formulas are applied so the simplest example we looked at for instance was the harmonic oscillator where h naught is p squared over 2m plus half 1 omega squared x squared and in this case we know that a n 0 is h cross omega n plus a half okay so those are the exact levels and then you can go on adding terms to, to this so suppose you add a lambda x it you can compute what is going to happen you can also in this problem do the problem exactly just to see how good perturbation theory is you do perturbation theory and then you do the problem exactly how do you do that exactly you complete squares it is just a displaced harmonic oscillator so all it does is to shift the potential and change the zero level of the potential so that problem can be actually completed this can be done analytically by defining some x prime is x plus some shifted value and completing squares and that is the end of the matter but you could also formally put it in into this perturbation expansion and see what happens and as far as the oscillator is concerned the best representation to use is simply uh, phi n zeros are just the oscillator unperturbed oscillator states the number states there then this perturbation x so for example h prime n n is going to be n and then an x and then an n and the way to do this is to write this in terms of creation raising and lowering operators a n a dagger and then you can see that the first term is going to be 0 the first order term is going to be 0 since x does not have diagonal matrix elements neither a nor a dagger has diagonal matrix elements a connects a state n on the left you must have an n minus 1 because a lowers and a dagger you must have an n plus 1 on the left otherwise these matrix elements are 0 so the diagonal elements are 0 but the second order term is going to contribute here. and I leave it to you as a simple exercise to show to what this whole thing is going to become in exact what the exact energy levels are going to be incidentally we know that when you complete squares 
you are going to get a lambda square term right and that is going to be the change in the energy and that is it it is exact and because of that this perturbation series will actually terminate in the second order term nothing else is going to happen and you would get the exact answer. So I leave you to work this out and show that in this problem which you can solve analytically compare it with what happens if you use the perturbation series okay. What happens if this perturbation had been x squared then of course this is not 0 because this is a plus a dagger squared and there are going to be terms like a dagger and a dagger a which are going to contribute definitely. So here the first order correction is not 0 and there would be a second order, third order etc. Do you expect this to terminate as a power series in lambda? Do you expect the series for En to terminate ever in that example? No, why not? Uh, you think there may not be bound states? Lambda is positive. Pardon? It is another harmonic oscillator. So, what is going to happen? So, what is going to happen? I can combine it with this, right? So, I can write this uh, thing as equal to p squared over 2m plus 1 half m omega prime squared x squared. I will simply write it in this form. right so now based on that tell me do you think the exact energy levels by the way the exact energy levels are half h cross omega prime times n plus half do you think that is going to terminate as a power series in lambda what is omega prime squared in terms of uh, omega is not that right right so the energy levels are going to be h cross omega prime into n plus half and omega prime is just this guy here. So is it going to terminate or not? No because it is got that square root therefore when you do a binomial expansion in powers of lambda over omega squared which is supposed to be small then this is going to go on forever. So you see even a very simple perturbation which you can interpret physically what is the interpretation here? I just change the spring constant I just change the increase the spring constant right that can lead to a perturbation series which goes on forever because it is not analytic it is got this square root of lambda sitting here a plus lambda sitting here and therefore when I do a perturbation expansion a binomial expansion it will show all pow possible powers although the exact answer is trivial to write down in this case. So you must watch for things like this by the way would this be true if I had written here not lambda but lambda squared just to make sure it is positive would it still be true yes except now only the even powers are going to appear right so this is just going to become lambda squared here and so nothing changes okay. it is still going to show all even powers of lambda when I expand what if I had this what if I have lambda x cubed as a perturbation well it is clear the first order term is going to be 0 because this thing is cubic and therefore you do not match powers of a and a dagger in the diagonal if there are no diagonal elements at all and there is a correction to first order but we know this potential is actually not bounded from below. So although the perturbation series will give you a formal answer you have to take this with a pinch of salt the exact answer is very different there are no rigorous bound states in this problem at all 
if I have lambda x to the power 4 that is a quartic oscillator I can then compute what happens uh, what the bounce rate energy is what are what is going to happen to various energy levels even though technically speaking even that x4 has problems even an x4 potential which we do not do not want to get into at the moment okay. Let us look at a realistic case let us look at uh, we know how to solve the hydrogen atom problem we looked at the central force problem suppose you had two electrons instead of one electron like in the helium problem and then ask what is going to be the energy levels and let us see if this can be solved exactly. This was one of the first problems to which perturbation theory was applied. So what does the helium problem look like the helium atom we look at the ground state wave function just for simplicity what is it going to look like the Hamiltonian is going to be so you have a nucleus and then you have electron 1 and electron 2 in orbit around it let us say the coordinate of electron 1 is R1 the coordinate of electron 2 is R2 and we write down the Hamiltonian of the system it is P1 squared over 2 m plus P2 squared or let us write it down independently first minus Z e squared over R1 if Z is the nuclear charge 2 in the case of helium so that is for electron 1 and then there is a P2 squared over 2 m minus Z e squared over R2 that is for the second one and then there is a Coulomb repulsion between the two electrons which you have to put it in which you have to put in and this is plus e squared I have divide I have used units in which 4 pi epsilon naught is 1 so that modulus R1 minus R2 that is this distance R12 this is the Hamiltonian of the system now of course if you did not have the second electron the problem is exactly solvable you get the hydrogenic levels ditto for the second fellow here so these two together constitute an H naught and that is solvable completely because this portion of the Hamiltonian commutes with this portion here it is like two independent sets of coordinates and all the one coordinates commute with the two coordinates and you can diagonalize the one and the two simultaneously okay. now what is the ground state energy level it is going to be minus 1 over n squared in Rydberg units right and now it is going to be twice that okay. so electron 1 would have got a certain ground state 2 would have got a certain ground state and this is just twice that ground state so let us call that energy some E naught we know what this uh, energy level is by solving the one electron problem you can solve this two they are completely uncoupled here then this portion is our equivalent of lambda h prime and this E squared would for example play the role of the perturbation parameter lambda so what would be the correction the first order correction that is the question we want to answer so what would be the correction E1 equal to this is phi naught uh, unperturbed E squared and then 1 over R1 let me just call it 1 over R12 that is the correction where phi 0 refers to the ground state of the system and with the superscript not means unperturbed completely unperturbed now all we need to know to do that thing is the wave function of the electron in the ground state now what is the wave function of the hydrogen atom in the ground state of the electron well we need some representation in which to calculate this quantity 
and what basis would you choose the position basis or the momentum basis what would you choose position space. So, we know the wave function in position space no? the wave function phi naught 0 and let me call it r actually it is a function of two variables it is r 1 and r 2 because there are two of these fellows here this by definition is r 1 r 2 phi naught 0 by definition it is the abstract ket vector the overlap with these position eigenstates r 1 refers to first electron r 2 to the second electron and by the way I have ignored spin here I have ignored the spin of the electrons here completely that too must be taken into account but for the moment we got we have ignored it. So, I have assumed there is no spin involved here now what is this equal to well what is the ground state of the electron in the hydrogen atom. If you got a single electron then the ground state wave function phi naught of r this is equal to some normalization e to the minus r over a naught where a naught is the Bohr radius and the normalization is square root of pi a naught cubed. This is the ground state wave function in the state in which the principal quantum number n is 1 l is 0 m is 0 just an exponential decay and a naught is the Bohr radius that is the wave function. Now however and what is the Bohr radius by the way in these units yeah it is h cross squared over m e squared that is the Bohr radius in the units in which I am working. If I put in a nucleus nuclear charge z what happens to this does the Bohr radius increase or decrease it decreases it gets closer. So, it decreases by a 1 over z factor. So, it becomes a equal to a naught over z the more the charge in the nucleus the tighter the whole thing is going to be. So, now what is the wave function what should this be this is unperturbed it is as if the two electrons were separate. So, each electron has a wave function 1 over square root pi a cubed not a naught e to the minus r over a. So, what is this going to be it is going to be 1 over pi a cubed two of these factors. So, pi a cubed and then e to the power minus r 1 plus r 2 over a because it is just the product of the two wave functions this is a direct product state it is just position space I can get 1 for r 1 for the first guy direct product with r 2 for the second guy. So, the each wave function is e to the minus r 1 over a e to the minus r 2 over a and the combined wave function is a product of these two in the unperturbed basis. So, it is just e to the minus r 1 plus r 2 over a. So, what is this equal to what does this become now this is equal to e squared that is here over and what is this integral what does this stand for now. Remember if you are going to if you are going to write this matrix element in the position basis then there is an integration right the final answer is not going to depend on r 1 or r 2 or anything it is integrated over completely. So, what is this equal to if you understand that then you understand this notation completely what should I therefore write. So, it is e squared and then there is these factors here. So, let us let us write this as integral d 3 r 1 for the first guy and then an integral d 3 r 2 for the second guy and then this wave function phi 0 0 r 1 r 2 star 
complex conjugate because you want the bra here and then the perturbation 1 over r 1 2 and then phi naught 0 r 1 r 2. So it stands for this integral it is a number now just a number it cannot depend on r 1 or r 2 or anything they are all integrated over. So is that clear how you go from this matrix element to that integral by definition this is what it means in the position basis. So we plug this in and then there is a 1 over pi a cube from one of these guys and pi a cube from the other fellow. So this whole thing becomes e squared over pi squared a to the power 6 and integral d3 r1 integral d3 r2 e to the power minus r1 plus r2 over a minus but a factor 2 because there is one from here and one from there the wave functions are all real in this case divided by modulus r1 minus r2. This is not such a simple integral to do because r1 and r2 kind of mixed up with each other right but that is the answer that is the first order correction to the energy if you can compute this integral then you know what the energy is going to be to first order in E squared okay. How does one do this how does one do an integral of this kind what coordinate system can we choose normally if you had just a single E to the minus R or something you would use spherical polar coordinates the matter is over but now you got that modulus R1 minus R2 in the denominator but does this remind you of something does that formula remind you of something it looks like the electrostatic energy of something or the other right what sort of charge density it looks like suppose you have a charge distribution and you want to calculate its electrostatic self energy then you take one volume element here another volume element there and ask product of the two charges in these volume elements divided by the distance that is going to give you the electrostatic potential energy. So it looks very much like the electrostatic potential energy of a charge distribution which is given by 1 over pi a cubed e to the minus r over a a kind of exponentially damped charge distribution it is exactly that it is exactly that. So if I have a charge distribution rho of r in space which is equal to e to the minus r over a e this e is the electronic charge sorry for using this over pi a cubed it is exactly that because the charge the electrostatic self energy is going to be d3 r r1 d3 r2 rho of r1 d3 r1 that gives you the charge in volume element dv1 this is the electrostatic energy apart from a 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught. So it really looks like these are charged clouds exponentially damped and then this overlap integral is giving you the potential energy the electrostatic potential energy or Coulomb energy that is exactly what this is we have not taken into account some very crucial things here we have not taken into account the spin of the electrons at all. What other factor have we not taken into account here related to the fact that the electrons have spin half we took the wave function to be just a product of the wave function of electron 1 times product of wave function of electron 2 but of course the electrons are indistinguishable so this wave function cannot be the right one it must be anti-symmetric under the exchange of the two electrons and you must include the spin also so that important factors have not been taken into account this is not quite the wave function you need what is called a Slater determinant it must be anti-symmetric it depends on the spin state the entire wave function must be anti-symmetric now 
let me remind you that if you have two spin half particles they can either be in a total s equal to 0 state or total s equal to 1 state. If they are total s equal to 0 state then the spin wave function is anti symmetric the spatial wave function is symmetric and in the ground state that would be the correct state and that is what we have taken into account. The fact that this position space wave function is symmetric is just e to the minus r1 by a e to the minus r2 by a is good enough for the ground state calculation. So what we are doing is calculating correction to the ground state in which indeed the two electrons are like this they are in a spin s equal to 0 state. If you looked at excited states then it is a different story you have to take these possibilities into account. So for the ground state this is a good approximation but we still have to compute this integral and how would one do that we need a formula for this and that is familiar to us from electrostatics. So let me go back and remind you of what we know from electrostatics. Uh, We know that uh, if you have two vectors R1 and R2 in electrostatics, so here is a vector R1 in some direction, there is that in another direction, and let us look at a coordinate system xyz in this fashion, and this is vector R1, that is vector R2 here. The angle between these two vectors the dihedral angle is some gamma say then modulus r1 minus r2 whole squared mod squared is r1 squared plus r2 squared minus 2 r1 r2 cosine of this angle gamma but there is a formula for that there is a formula for the cos gamma and what is that what is this well we know the following 1 over r1 minus r2 if you had been taught electrostatics properly this thing here is equal to a summation it is expanded in a power series in powers of R2 over R1 if R2 is smaller than R1 but if R1 is smaller than R2 in magnitude then you expand in a power series of R1 over R2 in both cases this can be written as 1 over R the larger of the two whichever is larger a summation L equal to 0 to infinity R smaller over R larger to the power L over all the integers L multiplied by coefficients which are going to depend on the cosine of the angle between the two multiplied by P L of cos, cos gamma these are the Legendre polynomials. I am sure you are familiar with this I am sure this has been done in various places and so on. In fact this is one way to introduce the Legendre polynomials they are the coefficients in the expansion of 1 over square root of R1 squared plus R2 squared minus 2 R1 R2 cos gamma and the answer is a, a series of polynomials in cos gamma and the co coefficients are R minus over R plus great R less over R greater to the power L. So all we need to know is what is the cosine of this angle here now what is the cosine of this angle in terms of the cosine of in terms of the polar angle of R angles of R1 the polar angles of R2 that comes from a following formula in spherical trigonometry done in high school yes spherical trigonometry has been abolished by law it is gone once again gone with the snows of yesteryear but <laughs> cos gamma there is a very well known formula in spherical trigonometry did you do you study spherical trigonometry at all these these days no this is uh, only plane trigonometry cos gamma is equal to well okay so it is gone along with alchemy and various other things or maybe alchemy is back if creationism is back alchemy should be back too why not magic should be back okay. So cos gamma is cos theta 
1 cos theta 2 plus sin theta 1 sin theta 2 these are the polar angles of vectors r1 and r2 and of course there must be a dependence on the azimuthal angles as well cos phi 1 minus phi 2 that is a well known addition theorem if you got two arbitrary vectors and the angle between them is the dihedral angle between them is gamma then the cosine of this gamma is given in terms of the cosines of the, the polar angles of uh, polar and azimuthal angles of the two individual vectors by this simple formula here. Hmm. This is just a special case of the addition theorem for Legendre polynomials because cos gamma is P1 of cos gamma, this is P1, P1 of x is x, but there is a general theorem for PL cos gamma itself. So, this quantity here can be written as 1 over r less summation l equal to 0 to infinity r less over r greater to the power l the summation over m and then there is a 2l plus 1 there is a 4 pi over 2l plus 1 which comes from the normalization factor of this guy here and it is some y l m of theta 1 phi 1 star y l m theta 2 phi 2 where y l m's are the spherical harmonics this is called the addition theorem for spherical harmonics so you can write pl cos gamma the general l in terms of this these y l m's and if you put l equal to 1 then you end up with the original addition theorem for this for this dihedral angle and these we know these quantities are square root of 2l 2l plus 1 over 4 pi times plm of cos theta 1 e to the power minus im phi 1 and so on for the other guy so whatever it is one can put this in into that expression and then do the integrals okay. So go to spherical polar coordinates for each of them it is in a nice factored form here and therefore you put that in here and then the price you pay is that there is a summation over L of course. So the price you pay for factoring this into something which depends on coordinates of R1 and R2 is that it becomes a summation there is a summation infinite sum and then you compute what this is and since there is an exponential makes it easy to calculate these quantities finally there are just some powers of L multiplied by these exponentials you have to be careful about convergence you must be careful when you integrate over R1 and R2 you must make sure that when you use that expansion you need one expansion in the cases where R2 is less than R1 and the other when R2 is bigger than R1 and then it is a numerical thing to compute it so this can be calculated and it gives a pretty good answer it gives a very very close uh, close answer it is like uh, I do not remember it is like some uh, uh, it is off by a few electron volts two or three electron volts out of several tens of electron volts so it is a fairly close answer it does not include all these other corrections it does not include the effect of spin it does not include the Pauli exclusion principle and so on and yet it gives a very very good answer and of course one can refine it and people have done this we know how to compute the helium problem we know how to compute the energy levels to fairly high uh, to an arbitrary degree of accuracy using this but as you can see it gets at some stage it gets numerical beyond a certain point you need to know how to do these integrals and you as you get to higher orders it will get worse and so on. So this is not the most efficient way of finding the energy levels of the helium atom you use what is called a variational method so you pretend that this z is a variable quantity and then you optimize you minimize the energy ground state energy with respect to these variational parameters and now people have done this using many many variational parameters simultaneously so the answers are known in for many electron systems the best way of finding these energies is by variational methods the answers are known to very high accuracy okay so this is just an indication of how perturbation theory would operate in such problems 
let us go on to what happens if you have a degeneracy in the problem. So, we need to address this and instead of writing the formalism down let me just indicate the way of doing this. So, suppose you have a situation where these are the where one of the energy levels is degenerate. So, the unperturbed levels are E 1 0 equal to E 2 0 and then E 3 0 E 4 0 and so on. So, this is uh, what the unperturbed levels look like there is a ground state that is degenerate or one state that is degenerate and then it goes on. For convenience I have taken these two to be degenerate but anywhere in between you could have a degeneracy and it does not have to be a two fold degeneracy it could be three fold four fold any finite order of degeneracy. Now in a problem like this this means there exists corresponding to this there exists an eigenstate phi 1 0 and an eigenstate phi 2 0 which are not equal to each other. This is what is meant by degeneracy there exists two linearly independent eigenstates corresponding to the same value of the energy of the Eigen value. And then of course, when you do the energy denominator I want to find the correction to E 1 0 I run into trouble because I have a summation over L not equal to N and when I sum over the value 2 this is going to blow up here. So, the question is what do I do how do I get rid of this problem okay. So, what one does is to say that the Hamiltonian is H naught plus lambda H prime and the difficulty arises because of this energy denominator E n 0 minus E L 0 when n is 1 and L is 2 or vice versa these two are exactly the same and it blows up and I need to take care of this problem. So, what you have to do is to note that in this subspace spanned by these two vectors diagonalize the problem exactly. So, what will the perturbation look like the perturbation H prime is going to have a phi 1 0 phi 1 0 and then in this subspace it is going to look like this phi 1 0 H prime by 2 0 and then the conjugate of that this is what the Hamiltonian matrix is going to look like in this subspace the full Hamiltonian there is still the H naught part that is irrelevant plus this guy here. So, let me call this some uh, some matrix uh, let us call it uh, U no, I should not call it U call it something else let me call this uh, matrix eta for example. Okay. The idea is to diagonalize this eta. So, let me write this as equal to H prime 1 1 H prime 1 2 H prime 2 1 H prime 2 2. The idea is to diagonalize this and then use the eigenvectors corresponding to the diagonalized form of this you can certainly diagonalize a 2 by 2 matrix without difficulty. So, use that as part of the unperturbed basis. So, as far as the subspace spanned by these two degenerate eigenvalues is concerned the eigen degeneracy is lifted you found the exact eigenvalues and the exact eigenfunctions corresponding to these two states and use those as part of your unperturbed basis. So, that is the basic trick. So, what would one do well I would say that instead of using so let us use psi 1 equal to some coefficient c 1 1 phi 1 0 plus c 1 2 
by 2 0 and psi 2 equal to C 2 1 by 1 0 plus C 2 2 by 2 0. So, instead of using in the unperturbed basis instead of using phi 1 0, phi 2 0 and of course, for this would be an eigenstate phi 3 0, phi 4 0 etcetera. Instead of using this as my unperturbed basis, I use instead psi 1, psi 2, phi 3 0, phi 4 0 etcetera as my basis. But I must choose the C 1s, the C i, C i j's in such a way that that C i j matrix diagonalizes this eta. So, that is the basic trick and this is a Hermitian matrix because the Hamiltonian is Hermitian. So, this is equal to the complex conjugate of that it is a Hermitian matrix these are real numbers. Therefore, you can always diagonalize it by a unitary transformation just as a symmetric matrix real symmetric matrix can be diagonalized by an orthogonal transformation a Hermitian matrix can be diagonalized by a unitary transformation. So, I insist that this matrix C 1 1, C 1 2, C 2 1, C 2 2 be a unitary matrix. So, let us call the matrix S uh, let us let us call U equal to C 1 1, C 1 2, C 2 1, C 2 2 such that U eta U in dagger is diagonal. So, I choose my C 1 1, C 1 2 etcetera in such a way that this is a unitary matrix and it diagonalizes this eta and then the job is done. What I should use instead of E n zeros, instead of E 1 0 and E 2 0 I must choose the actual eigenvalues, the actual diagonalized eigenvalues. What is the what are the eigenvalues of this guy? what are the eigenvalues of this matrix? It is lambda minus h 1 1 prime minus h 1 2 prime h 1 2 prime h 2 1 prime lambda minus h 2 2 prime. This guy here is 0 implies lambda squared minus lambda h 1 1 prime plus h 2 2 prime uh, plus h 1 1 prime h 2 2 prime minus mod h 1 2 prime squared equal to 0. Okay. And if I diagonalize it the eigenvalues lambda plus or minus are equal to h 1 1 prime plus h 2 2 prime plus or minus square root of squared uh, over 2. this correct uh, minus this guy here okay and we can find what the eigen vectors corresponding to this are uh, that is a well very well known formula for the 2 by 2 case. So, I define tan theta equal to twice modulus h 1 2 prime over h 1 1 prime minus T 2 prime. Then the Eigen value then corresponding to lambda plus you have an Eigen vector which is say u 1 u 2 such that u 1 over u 2 is equal to uh, well let us cut a long story short and write down what the answer is. So, this is just cos theta over 2 plus sin theta over 2 
this is minus sin theta over 2 and this is cos theta. where tan theta is given by this. Okay. So for a 2 by 2 problem this appears so often that one remembers this is a very standard thing here and that is it. So now you are guaranteed that you know the exact eigenvalues they are the E10 plus or minus these guys this once this is added and use that as part of your basis and then the job is done there are no degeneracies left anymore. So what has actually happened is that the perturbation has lifted the degeneracy and has created two new energy levels from it which are not degenerate with each other and I use the Eigen functions corresponding to that the exact Eigen functions these are the exact Eigen functions there is no perturbation here this is square root is taken to all orders we actually know what this thing is and now you can generalize this if you have 3, 4, 5 whatever it is you can generalize it to any number of uh, any finite degeneracy okay. So this is how uh, a degenerate case would be handled okay. many many uh, famous examples where you have such kinds of uh, degeneracy finite uh, degeneracy and then it is lifted by doing this first here. But all this is still time independent perturbation theory we still not address the question of what happens if you put in time dependence in the Hamiltonian if you pump from outside you supply energy or remove energy and the last thing I want to do next thing we want to do is to address that because that is what is going to tell us what causes uh, what causes transitions between unperturbed energy levels whereas here what we are trying to do is there is a fixed perturbation and we know what the unperturbed levels are and we are trying to compute what happens under the effect of the perturbation. So both degenerate and non-degenerate cases we have looked at very briefly but the real interest now in time dependent problems would be to look at transition rates and we need to do that again we are going to do things to first order in perturbation theory we are going to arrive at a rule it is called the Fermi golden rule which is essentially going to tell us what is the transition rate to go from one level to another under a given perturbation. So let us do that last I will probably take that up tomorrow uh, any questions on what we have done so far yeah what happened was all these levels you see if you had a non-degenerate problem and these were your energy levels then under the perturbation this level maybe goes here this level goes here this one goes there and so on and we can compute it to any order. Now the problem was you had a degenerate level here two of them sitting right on top of each other then the strategy is to say when I include the perturbation in general when I include H prime then because H prime became the total Hamiltonian now has off diagonal elements as well. I start this splits automatically into this these are the two energy levels okay. now I calculate what is the effect of the perturbation that we have added to this entire system okay but please notice that these are not the exact energy levels under the perturbation because physically what is happening when you do second order perturbation theory all the unperturbed energy levels are affecting each given energy level because remember the energy denominator all the levels because there is a summation over all the unperturbed levels are affecting each of these levels. So what we did was to pretend in this degenerate perturbation theory that none of these fellows exist and then I put in the H prime and diagonalized only this portion and I use this as part of my basis now instead of this. I use these fellows as my basis and then ask what is the effect of perturbation. So all of them are going to be shifted once again but these are no longer degenerate therefore the energy denominators uh, vanishing does not play a role anymore so that was the strategy. So the second order perturbation theory really is a statement of the fact that when you apply a perturbation the entire unperturbed spectrum affects each level 
in the perturbed spectrum even the distant ones even they have a role to play because it depends on the matrix element please remember that the second order correction to the energy level n went like lambda squared summation l not equal to n h prime ln squared over an0 minus al0 so the nth energy level this energy level got affected by all the other l's here to an extent which depends on this difference and of course if this difference is very large the distant levels from this n are not going to play much of a role but how much they play what role they play depends on how big this matrix element is so it depends on what connects to what if h prime has a strong matrix element between two particular levels that is going to significantly contribute to the correction due to the perturbation so finally physically you can see what is happening this operator does it connect two different levels or not is there a non vanishing matrix element and if so how big is it okay. and these quantities these uh, mod squared of these matrix element in atomic physics they are often called oscillator strengths because this whole thing plays a very very fundamental role in atomic physics when you do perturbation theory for energy levels and this is like some given weight factors but these strengths control what connects to what so that was the strategy used here and I did this for the doubly degenerate case but for any finite degeneracy you can use a similar kind of thing okay. now of course it is possible that the first order correction this degeneracy is not lifted in the first order it could go on to the next order and so on and so forth that too can happen but it gets a little more algebraically complicated but the principle is clear the principle is that in that subspace you diagonalize you find the exact levels to that order pretending nothing else exists and then use that as the basis so that was the strategy okay okay so let me stop here and